Long-Term Damage from COVID-19, The Neurological Consequences Fatigue, Headaches, Strokes SARS-CoV-2 also causes serious damage in the brain. It has now been proven that the virus can cross the blood-brain barrier and even infect unborn babies. How can it be stopped? Previously, it was thought that the effects of the disease were limited to infections of the throat, respiratory tract, lungs, liver, and kidneys, but it is now clear that COVID-19 is also a neurological disease that wreaks havoc in the brain. From hundreds of studies conducted worldwide, we know that every second COVID-19 patient suffers from disorders of the central nervous system. The earliest evidence came in the form of a paper by Chinese researchers published in the Journal of the American Medical Association on the 10th of April. The spectrum of problems ranges from loss of smell and taste, headaches, memory disorders, concentration difficulties and fatigue, to meningitis and strokes. The virus even goes so far as to invade the brains of embryos. In the course of autopsies, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has been detected not only in the brains of deceased corona patients, but also in the brain of an embryo whose mother died of corona. In this connection, however, there is also a reason to breathe a sigh of relief. It appears that the hormone estrogen has a valid protective mechanism that we have not yet been able to explain. There is empirical evidence to suggest that women are much more likely to have a less severe course of disease than men. This means that women of childbearing age with a high estrogen level are more likely to be protected from a severe bout of COVID-19. It is interesting to note that women are much more frequently affected by olfactory and taste disorders. We think that loss of taste occurring right at the beginning of the infection is an indication of a milder course of the disease. In any case, it is clear that the SARS-CoV-2 virus can enter the brain via the olfactory epithelium of the nose. Magnetic resonance imaging has revealed inflammation in the adjacent frontal lobe. It has not yet been fully validated, but is nonetheless highly likely that the SARS-CoV-2 virus also travels via the gastrointestinal tract and the vagus nerve into the brainstem and can migrate from there to the respiratory center. Our colleagues at John Hopkins University in the USA have carried out a very impressive piece of experimental work in which they have discovered that SARS-CoV-2 can implant itself in the brain and also multiply there. We regard this as very bad news. We now know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus can infect brain cells as well as their dendrites. The dendrites are branched extensions of nerve cells. The John Hopkins team used human stem cells to produce miniature brains consisting of around 30,000 nerve cells and having a diameter of around one-third of a millimeter. These mini-brains, also called organoids, were exposed to coronaviruses in a high-security laboratory. The hazardous work involved the wearing of a full body suit and was carried out by postdoctoral students. They were able to show that the viruses dock with the ACE2 receptors of nerve cells. This is the usual point of entry, as we have been pointing out for the past several months. After 72 hours, the number of viruses had already increased more than a hundredfold. This is a dynamic process that does not stop of its own accord. The brain is the one place in the body where the virus cannot be shaken off. The John Hopkins team stress that the viruses which lodge in the brain have found a safe refuge where they are protected from attacks by the immune system. Even a drug-based treatment is hardly possible there, as many active substances cannot overcome the blood-brain barrier. There is a parallel here with the AIDS virus because this too can implant itself in the brain. Today, AIDS viruses can be eliminated throughout the entire body with the help of drugs, but not in the brain. When a patient stops taking medication, the HI viruses crawl out of their hiding place again. We think that this is also the case with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We will not have final observable confirmation of this for several years, which is a very worrying thought for us. The positive aspect is that very few brain cells have ACE2 receptors, which is what the SARS-CoV-2 virus needs to latch onto. But, when an infected cell explodes after reproducing thousands of viruses, these can readily find other brain cells with ACE2 receptors. The investigations conducted by the John Hopkins team showed a further increase in the viral load within the midi-brains, even after six days had elapsed. 
For most neurological symptoms to manifest themselves, however, it is not necessary for the coronavirus to actually enter the brain. It can also cause indirect harm to the central and peripheral nervous system. There are several mechanisms for this. Firstly, the acute lack of oxygen in severe pneumonia can lead to damage of nerve cells and thus to various cognitive problems. Secondly, the immune response, which is intensified by SARS-CoV-2, can also cause inflammation in the brain and peripheral nerves. Most of the consequential damage is then autoimmune-induced inflammation. On the positive side, however, we find that the exaggerated immune response disappears again after recovery. Thirdly, we are now also seeing so-called COVID strokes. The above-average susceptibility of corona patients to strokes is again a consequence of the fact that infection with the coronavirus significantly exacerbates any inherent tendency to thrombosis. As we have reported on previous occasions, there are already many cases in which the diagnosis of stroke is the first indication of a corona infection that has so far gone undetected. It should be noted that younger people without risk factors can also be affected by a COVID stroke. We can determine the tendency to blood clotting by measuring so-called D-dimers. In corona patients suffering from a stroke, the concentration of D-dimers is significantly higher than in normal stroke patients. In any case, the tendency to increased blood coagulation and thrombosis seems to be an indirect consequence of the disturbed immune response of the body. This is one of the reasons why we have set out to continuously measure and monitor coagulation factors as part of our Salvagene C19 immunization program. Because of its enormous importance, we will also include the D-dimer value in our Salvagene C19 immunization program in the future. If it is clear that a high D-dimer value, and thus an increased tendency to clotting, is present, anticoagulant medication should be administered. In our Salvagene C19 immunization program, we have adopted a different approach, namely that of prevention, and therefore already work preventatively with natural blood thinners in order to keep the blood clotting factors at a level that is as normal as possible, so that the consequences of a possible infection are less severe. If the coagulation factors are already suboptimal before an infection, the attending physicians are faced with a dilemma. On one hand, there is a risk that the patient's own large blood vessels will become clogged, while on the other hand, hemorrhaging is equally life-threatening. If the blood thinners are not of natural origin, recourse must be made to pharmaceutical drugs such as Markimer. On the basis of our background in genetics, we suspect that genetic predisposition influences the course of the disease, and we will soon be publishing a special keynote on this topic. Blood group polymorphism is also an indication because we already know that individuals with blood group O are much less likely to have a severe reaction to COVID-19 than those with blood group A. We are currently working with several polymorphisms that are instrumental in determining whether the disease takes a more or less severe course. There are several mechanisms involved in so-called COVID-19 fatigue, which also has a neurological background. If COVID-19 patients complain of persistent fatigue long after the disease is abated, this may, on the one hand, be a consequence of diffuse brain damage caused during the acute stage of the disease. But on the other hand, it can also be the consequence of corona-induced myocarditis. Scars on the heart give rise to reduced resilience, which in turn leads to rapid exhaustion. Consequently, our Salvagene C19 immunization program includes a heart checkup, in the course of which the heart vessels are examined more closely. Of course, all this is always done under the condition that the patient does not become infected. As already explained in Keynote 29, where the B cells are poorly developed, the immune system can get stuck in a perpetual loop. Please check salvagene.com daily for the latest ticker information and contact us for customized recommendations based on your latest test results.